economic gap between the two worlds spells misery for the developing countries, but it also threatens the industrialized nations with unemployment and with dangerous recession and economic exposure. We have reason to think that the imperialists themselves are in a divided council about the unity of Africa. They must remain ambivalent. However, as long as they retain direct control over southern Africa and new colonial control over the country, the vast mineral wealth of these territories represent profits which they cannot willingly give up, even for greater matters in the rest of Africa. But the Union Government of Africa would end the dilemma of the industrialized nations because inevitably the world will be converted into capital for the development of Africa. The fact that imperialism and new colonialism are in that dilemma should be for us the clearest indication of the course we must follow. We must unite for economic viability First of all, and then to recover our mineral wealth in Southern Africa so that our vast resources and capacity <coughs> for development will bring prosperity for us and additional benefit for the rest of the world. That is why I have written elsewhere that the emancipation of Africa is the emancipation of Africa. Is there any need to point out today? that we are potentially the world's richest continent. Not only in mineral wealth, but also in hydroelectric power. The wealth of the Sahara is yet untapped. The waters and rivers of Tanganyika and Ethiopia are yet unharnessed. All the capital we need for the development of these regions flows out of Africa today in gold, diamond, copper, uranium, and other minerals from South Africa, Northern Rhodesia, the Congo, and other parts of the continent. Mr. Chairman, what is lacking for us in Africa? But the will and the courage to unite a divided but compact Today, the countless ways our people learn that their poverty is not a curse from the gods or a burden imposed by imperialists, but a political defect in our independence. The general realization grows that independence is not in Africa, for that is the emancipation and development of our country. We in Africa are living in the most momentous era of our history. In a little less than one decade, the majority of the territories in our continent have emerged from colonialism into sovereignty and independence. In a few years from now, we can envisage that all Africa will be free from colonial rule. Nothing, nothing can stem our onward march. While we have cause to rejoice in this achievement, our central problem as independent states is the fragmentation of our territories into little independent states and out of policies and programs into a patchwork of conflicting objectives and uncoordinated development and plans. While the post-war years have seen a phenomenal rise in the prices of manufactured goods, which we need to sustain progress and development in our state. The prices of raw materials, which we export to these countries, have shown an alarmingly steady decline. So the disparity between the have or the highly developed nations and the have not or developing nations becomes inevitably wider and wider as our needs grow later and later. 
How can we resolve this tragic paradox? Except by uniting our forces and working together in Africa as a team. Let us therefore move forward together in unity and in strength, confident in the knowledge that with such immense national and human resources at our disposal in our country, we cannot fail to make Africa one of the happiest, most prosperous and progressive areas of the world. Two years ago, you were exposed to the ridicule of the world because they saw us as a divided Africa. They call us all sorts of names, which help to widen the apparent gap among us. The radical Casablanca powers, the moderate Morovia group, and the pro-French Brazzaville states. There was no justification for these labels. But with imperialism, they were a very <coughs> convenient means of giving the dog a bad name and hanging him. It is to our eternal credit that last year at Addis Ababa we put our enemy to shame by forging a common charter from these groupings and emerging as the Organization of African Union. Mr. Chairman, President and Prime Minister, let it be said that at Cairo we put them to greater shame by agreeing to the establishment of a union government of Africa. Have you noticed, brother presidents and prime ministers, that as soon as we achieve this measure of agreement at this apartment, the new colonialists and their agents proceeded to sow new seeds of disruption and decision among us. They became particularly active and vocal in preaching the new and dangerous doctrine of step-by-step -step course towards African Union. Mr. Chairman, if we take one step at a time, when they are in a position to take six steps for every single one of ours, our weakness will, of course, be emphasized and exaggerated for their benefit. One step now, two steps later, <laughs> then all will be fine for in Africa for imperialism and new colonialism. To say that the Union Government for Africa is premature is to sacrifice Africa on the altar of new colonialism. <laughs> Brother Presidents and Friends and Prime Ministers, let us move forward together in the wider fields of our heritage, strong in our unity, where our common aspirations and hopes find abundant expression in the power of our united endeavors. All over Africa, the essential economic pattern developed under colonialism remains. Not one of us, despite our political independence, has yet succeeded in breaking in any substantial measure our economic subservience to economic systems external to Africa. It is the purpose of new colonialism to maintain this economic relationship. The developed countries need the raw materials of Africa to maintain their own industries. And they are unsure to find markets in Africa for their manufactured goods. But there can be no market for these manufactured goods unless the people of Africa have the money with which to buy them. Therefore, I see that the developed nations and countries have a vested interest in Africa's prosperity and unity. In many cases, our most valuable raw materials, such as minerals, 
are owned and exploited by foreign companies. Large parts of the world in Af of Africa, which could be used for the economic development of Africa, are drained out of the continent in this way to bust the economies of the developed nations. It is true that the whole world is poised at a delicate economic balance and that economic collapse in one part of the world would have grave repercussions on us. Our situation in Africa is so weak that we are bound to be the first and the most sufferers if economic difficulties should set in in Europe or America. And the effect upon us would be absolute and catastrophic. We have nothing to fall back on. We have become so utterly dependent upon these outside economic systems that we have no means of resisting to external economic fluctuations. We have no economic resilience, whatever, within our own country. We are so cut off from one another that in many cases, the road system in each of our countries peter out into bush as they approach the frontier of our neighbors. How can we? trade among ourselves when we do not even have power or the proper means of physical communication. It is now possible to travel by air from Accra to London in six hours. I can fly from Accra to Nairobi and from Accra to Cairo in half a day. It is easy for us to get together and talk. But on the ground, over which we fly, with such ease and nonchalance, it is frequently impossible to engage in the most elementary trades simply because there are no proper rules. And because we are artificially divided and organized. Our few and negligible roads and railways always lead ultimately to some point. In a sense, they have become symbols of our economic subservience and our dependence on trade outside the African continent. We have inherited from colonialism an economic pattern from which it is difficult to escape. Great forces are arrayed to block our escape when individually we try to find some economic independence, pressure are brought against us that are often irresistible owing to our disunity. I am not arguing that we should not or we should cut off all economic relationship with countries outside Africa. I am not saying that we should spurn foreign trade and reject foreign investment. What I am saying is that we should get together think together, plan together, and organize our African economy as a unit and negotiate our overseas economic relationship as part of our general continental economy. And only, only, only in this way can we negotiate economic arrangements on terms first towards the South African states. The organization of African unity was a declaration of intention to unite. It was an optimistic beginning, but we need more, more than this. We must unite now under union government if this intention is to have any meaning and relevance at all. Talk is worthless if it does not lead to action. And so far, as Africa is concerned, action will be impossible if it's in the further today. Those forces which endanger our continent <coughs> do not stand still. They are moving, they are not moving step by step. In fact, they are marching in double step against us. Every day we delay the establishment of a union government of Africa, we subject ourselves to outside economic domination. And our political independence as separate states 
becomes more and more meaningless. Brother President and Prime Minister, as I said a few moments ago, this decade is Africa's finest hour. Great things are in store for us if we would but take our courage in our own hands and reach out toward them. How would, would South Africa dare to sentence Nelson Mandela and his seven brave colleagues against protest of a united Africa? How could Portugal dare think of continuing the violation of the sovereignty under Angola and Mozambique and the so-called Portuguese Guinea? If these form part of a united government of Africa, how could a white settler minority government in Southern Rhodesia dare to lock up in Como and see for We have gone to Geneva to seek a major victory over our first for fair play and justice in international trade. There were no less than 75 of us, Africans, 75 of us, in one group set against a few of the great industrial communities of Europe and the United States. And yet, how weak was our bargaining power because of our political and economic disunity and divisions? How much more effective would our efforts have been if we had spoken with the voice or with the one voice of Africa's millions? With all our minerals and water power and fertile land, is it not a cause for shame that you remain poor and content to plead for aid from the very people who have robbed us of our riches in the past? How can Egypt, strategically situated as it is, come back, or oh, assist to come back, the imperialism and new colonialism, and solve the pressing and urgent problems of the Middle East, unless it has the backing of a union government of Africa? Only a union government can assist effectively to the solution of the problems of the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. Mr. Chairman, let us remember for the President and Prime Minister, the Sahara no longer divides us. We do not see Africa merely as Arab Africa, Black Africa, English Africa, French Africa and that Africa. We are one people, one continent and one country. Do 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 do